Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with objections to the Gollum cosmological argument for the existence of God. This is going to be objections to premise two, if you haven't checked out objections to premise one, and the original iteration of the cosmological argument that I've put out there. You might want to check those out now. So, if you don't remember, premise two is the universe began to exist, and Craig gives to us a defense of this premise. He says, an actual infinite cannot exist, a beginningless temporal series of events is an actual infinite, therefore, a beginningless temporal series of events cannot exist. Because premise 7 just follows logically from premises 5 and 6, we're going to take a look just at how to object to premises 5 and 6, because we're not doubting logic, at least in this video. So, first off, an actual infinite cannot exist. Craig gives us a lovely thought experiment and following argument to defend this premise. He says, imagine a library with an actual infinite number of books. Half the books are red and half are black. The argument goes as follows. There are an infinite number of books in the library. There are an infinite number of red books in the library. There are less red books than total books because only half of the books are red. There are also as many red books as total books because there are an infinite number of each. Therefore, the number of red books is both equal to and less than the total number of books. So, there is some problem in one of our initial assumptions. Craig is going to say that the problem lies in saying that an actual infinite can exist. If you're curious about this version of argument, you should check out my recent video on reductio ad absurdum, because that's what Craig's doing here. In order to understand where this argument kind of goes wrong, let's take a look at a similar version of this argument with numbers. So, an actual infinite cannot exist. Before we get into this, I'm going to offer a couple of definitions for those of you who aren't so mathematically inclined. Natural numbers. Natural numbers are the counting numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Square numbers. Square numbers are the product of a natural number and itself. 1 times 1 equals 1, 2 times 2 equals 4, 3 times 3 equals 9, and so on and so forth. Square numbers are a subset of natural numbers. All square numbers are natural numbers, but not all natural numbers are square numbers. There is no natural number which multiplied by itself will give us 2. The square root of 2, which is what number multiplied by itself would give us 2, is not a natural number. However, every square number is going to be a natural number, even though numbers like 2, 3, and 5 are not going to be square numbers as well. So square numbers are a subset of natural numbers. However, for every natural number, there has to be a square number, because the only way you get a square number is by multiplying some natural number by itself. So, it seems we're going to run into a similar problem that Craig did. Let's take a look at a very similar argument. So, assume we imagine a set of all natural numbers and a set of all square numbers. There are an infinite number of natural numbers. That's just the definition of natural numbers. There are an infinite number of square numbers. There are less square numbers than natural numbers, because square numbers are a subset of natural numbers. There are as many square numbers as natural numbers, because the only way you can get a square number is by multiplying a natural number by itself. And finally, the number of square numbers is both equal to and less than the number of natural numbers. Hmm. So, it looks like, according to this argument, we should just throw out most of math. Well, that's probably not what we're going to do, or what most mathematicians would have us do. In fact, we should be able to see that the problem here lies in premise 3, that there are less square numbers than natural numbers. Both square numbers and natural numbers are infinite sets. Just because square numbers seems to be a smaller infinity than natural numbers doesn't mean that it actually is. It, in fact, isn't. They're both infinite. Half of infinity is still infinity, which means that just because half of the books in the library are red doesn't mean that there are less red books than there are total books in the library. It seems a little counterintuitive, but infinities actually behave very differently than finite quantities. I press this point home simply because it is founded on mathematics, and mathematics are generally a little more firm or stable, or it would be a lot harder to doubt them. You'd have to throw a lot of things out the window, as a skeptic often does, to doubt mathematics. So, with that out of the way, let's move on to doubting premise 6. So, premise 6, a beginningless series of temporal events, is an actual infinite. Well, there's an assumption here. If the universe did 
not have a cause, then it must have been a beginningless series of temporal events. What I'm going to do is offer two different versions in which the universe didn't have a cause but wasn't a beginningless series of temporal events. One of them is offered by me, one of them is offered by Mr. Stephen Hawking. So imagine, instead of being a kind of linear universe that goes from a beginning to an end, the universe is a circle. And it always goes in the same circle. It's not a spiral that kind of changes every time around. It, in fact, is always going to be exactly the same. The now, what is happening now, just goes around the circle. What is past is in the future, and what's in the future is also in the past. Everything that's going to happen has already happened and will happen again. Here, there's no beginning. It just goes around in a circle. It doesn't go on forever, so it's not an actual infinite in the same sense. There's a finite number of events that are happening in this universe. It just matters where the now is on the universe. So it doesn't seem that this kind of beginningless series is an actual infinite in any important way. Let's take a look now at an argument offered by Mr. Stephen Hawking. So according to Stephen Hawking, what happens as we go back in time is the universe gets more and more and more compressed, and as it gets more dense, the speed of time actually slows down. Time itself actually changes. And what Stephen Hawking says is this speed is going to slow down so much that the universe going back in time, we would never reach a time zero of the universe. You would never get to a point going backwards in time that you would hit time zero because things would slow down so much you would actually have an asymptote of this lovely curved line that I have here representing the universe at time zero. The universe would never reach time zero because it would slow down too much to do so. This is another way that you could have a series of temporal events going back that approach the beginning, but never actually reach that beginning without having something like that actual infinite. That was a series of objections to the universe began to exist, premise two. Premise three just logically follows from premises one and two. I covered this in the original column cosmological argument piece. It's not something that one would really object to. The only way you could really do it would be to say that the universe isn't a kind of thing that the, cos the causal principle applies to. If you wanted to do that, you should check out my video on Russell's objections to Thomas Aquinas' cosmological argument, because that objection is going to be covered there. So our next video, therefore, is going to be objections to the final premise or conclusion of the cosmological argument. Since no scientific explanation in terms of physical laws can provide a causal account of the origin of the universe, the cause must be personal. Explanation is given in terms of a personal agent, also known as God. Watch this video and more at cardaities.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.